and welcome to Life on Point. My name is Darren. I'm one of the pastors at Connection Point Church, and with me is lead pastor Chris Vault. And do us a massive solid wherever you're watching this or listening to this, whether it's Spotify, YouTube, uh, wherever it is you watch this, please do us a, a massive favor. Give us a five-star review. Uh, give us a thumbs up. Put a comment in there. Share, share, share. Help us get the message out so more and more people can see what and hear what is going on on so we can help people with their walk with the Lord. And today we're going to continue with questions and answers. And and you guys sent some interesting ones and uh, and they're tough. So we probably won't do many questions today. Uh, in fact, we're going to combine two into one and uh, because then you'll f- probably find out why. So these are going to be deep. Uh, these are going to be uh, uh, in some people's cases are going to they're going to be very impactful because some of this will have impacted almost all of us, our Absolutely. lives at some point or the other. Uh, we all have a friend or, or something that has been impacted by this family member. And so we're going to ask the questions and we'll take a little time answering all of them. In fact, we'll take a lot of time. And, and what we want you to do is be sure as you listen to the answers, hear the heart of what's being answered. And, and if you need to go back and listen to it again, cause we will give references to the Bible and all of these things. And so, don't ever take out of context what, what we hear. And I know it's real easy to do because when you start talking about hot button topics, yeah. it's people hear a word and they and they latch on to it and they don't take in the totality of what all was said. So we're going to answer the, ask the first one and you'll see what I'm talking about right off the bat. Question one, is suicide an unpardonable sin? And what we're going to do is we're going to combine it and you'll see why later. What is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Mm. Yeah. yeah you know, like you said, today you you guys that sent us in some really difficult subject matters. There's a lot of emotions on right. this subject specifically on suicide, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and the next question that we're going to come to in a moment. There are some strong emotions on from any perspective around these subjects. And we recognize that. And that just not just feelings and emotions, but in some cases there is doctrine uh, that other people have put out there against certain things that is interesting. Yeah, absolutely. You know, especially this topic on yep. suicide or blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What What is the blasphemy, right? Um, and so we just want to say this. Um, as we talk about these very sensitive subjects, uh, our challenge, our goal is simply to go to Scripture. Now, right. if we're going to go to Scripture to get the answer, this forces us all to do something, and we're going to invite you to do this with us. We all have to put personal preferences and persuasions aside. We also have to put aside the things we've heard others teach us or say about these things in order to just go to Scripture and then let Scripture dictate how we interpret Mm, these passages, right? Or these topics, because some of these topics do lead into some interpretation because maybe like suicide is not spoken just so directly to, though you see the, the, you you see it in scriptures, just not like directly spoken to. Right. And so you have some freedom of interpretation and you may agree or you may disagree with us today. That's right. And that should not be a bar of fellowship. Our goal simply is to go to Scripture and do the best we can at looking at how Scripture discusses this. How can we theologically interpret this properly in light of all Scripture? And as you said a moment ago, not pulling one verse out of context to make it say what you've always heard it to be quoted that way or said that way or your personal preference. What does the totality of Scripture say in reference to this topic, right? So... You know, when you come to suicide, there are emotions because, you know, I I dare say there's probably not very many people, at least in America and in in our culture today, Western culture hasn't been touched in one form or fashion with suicide. Right. Uh, I know our personal family, not our immediate family, but in Mm -hmm. my family, we have went through that journey with loved ones in our family. Um, we have incredible members of our church oh, that yeah. have walked very personally through right. this area of suicide. Many of you watching have been yep. touched by suicide. And 
Uh, and first, so we want to say uh, we understand and and definitely we want to pray and encourage one yeah. another. I also want to say this before we dive into you know the question, is this the unpardonable sin or not? Is there forgiveness for someone who commits suicide? If you yourself are struggling with the thoughts of suicide, please reach out to someone. You are not alone. Right. There is help. Reach out to a spiritual leader, a family member, a teacher, a counselor, a therapist. Reach out to someone and get the help you need. Do you know that suicide is the number two cause of death today in America among teenagers? Well, that's terrible, but true. And uh, so this is a topic we need to discuss. There is hope for families who have been left behind. Suicide always leaves a wake of pain. Uh, and so let's talk about, it. is suicide a sin? Yes. Of course it suicide is. is a sin. Yep. Does that make it the unpardonable sin? No. No, and it's and it's not something you kind of mentioned it. It's not some big subject matter within the Bible. In fact, if you technically, it's only mentioned six times in, right. in totality of the Bible. Right. And uh, and so and and so therefore, we have to look at the uh, again. We have to look at the full measure of the Bible to understand this, because part of this question always comes down to, as you mentioned, is that unpardonable? Yes. Is it something that you cannot? maintain a salvation through. And I think that's the direction you're going to go specifically as you start unveiling this. Yeah, because, you know, whether it's uh, a, a funeral that I have had right. to preach and I've had to do multiples mm -hmm. of folks through suicide or like even, as I mentioned a moment ago, members within our family unit. Um, the number one question that suicide leaves the family and friends who are left behind with is, is there any hope? Mm, yeah. that they will get to heaven or does this immediately condemn them to hell? Right. And some of you watching, you know, you have depending on your religious persuasion or what you've been taught is how you will answer that question. Right. right. And I get it. So what this really comes down to is what is your doctrinal understanding of salvation? That's mm, where we yeah. have to go with this. First and foremost, what does Scripture teach about salvation? Mm. Then we can go back and ask the question, is suicide then the mortal sin that you can't, is that blasphemy, um, the unpardonable sin? Well, let's think about a few things here. What do we know the Bible teaches about salvation? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 right. tells us that we are saved by grace through faith, this is not of ourselves. It is God's gift. In other words, we don't receive God's forgiveness and eternal life and redemption through any works right. of our own. We are not saved because we are good enough, because we are perfect enough, or, we're, or we earn it. You must come and surrender to what Jesus has already done. Jesus is the only sinless sacrifice who took our sin to the cross and rose from the grave. We're not saved by our works. John 3, 3, Jesus said to Nicodemus, I tell you, unless someone is born again, right. he will not see the kingdom of heaven. So there has to be a spiritual rebirth, which again only comes through personal faith in Christ, not of our works. We have to be born again of the Spirit by mm -hmm. surrendering our lives, and it's a work of the Holy Spirit that brings about regeneration or salvation, right? Right. Paul would say this in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if you are in Christ, now listen, this is powerful. If you have truly repented of your sin, you've surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, received his gift of forgiveness and salvation, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Mm, that's right. The old has passed away and the new has come. In other words, your sins, past, present, and future have been forgiven. You are now redeemed through Christ. Your old is gone. You are made new. This is, again, what Jesus is talking about, being born again. Romans 8.15. Yep, Romans, Romans 8.15 says this. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear when you become a Christian. Instead, you've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now, And I love this passage because 
One, he says that once we are saved, truly saved, we're adopted. Right. And so a question has to be asked, do you ever become unadopted? Of course not. No, when you're adopted, you're, you're adopted. part of the family. Yeah, because you're grafted in. The word Abba, Father, you know this, mm-hmm. in the original language, mm-hmm. is the most intimate right. term for God right. uh, that was in their language. The, in the English... It corresponds to daddy. Yep. However, to the Jew, Abba is more intimate than our English word of daddy. Right. We don't even have a word in our language to describe the intimacy to this. Right. And Paul says, when you're saved, this is the intimate relationship you have with the Father. Ephesians 1.13 says, In Christ we are sealed mm. with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard, and watch this, because we're going to come back to this verse again a little bit later. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. Mm, yep. So then again, it's not an act of works. It's an act of faith. When you heard the gospel and you believed on the Lord Jesus, and what did the Holy Spirit do in that moment? You were sealed. Right. You ever sent a package? You seal it up. It's only to be opened by the owner. Yep, that's right. By the recipient. Um, we're sealed only to be opened by Christ alone. Right. We're his seal, right? So I, I want us just to walk through the scriptures because what does scripture teach us about salvation? Here's another thing. Receiving the gift of salvation does not mean sinless perfection. Correct. This is a big deal. Thank goodness. That we have to deal with, right? Because there are some who teach that once you're saved, you reach sinless perfection yep. and you never sin again. <laughs> My personal opinion is they just did. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they just lied. <laughs> because <laughs> none of us are perfect. Even though you're saved and redeemed, we still deal with this flesh. Right. Probably the most um, blatant passage to this in the scriptures is the Apostle Paul himself in Romans chapter 7. And here's a man who's arguably the greatest theologian outside of Jesus in the New Testament, correct? Right. And here Paul, in Romans 7, you can feel his exasperation with himself. Correct. And he says in verse 15, I don't understand what I'm doing because I, pr- I do not practice what I want to do. I do what I hate. Yep. Now, if I do what I don't want to do, I agree with the law that it's good. So now I'm no longer the one doing it, but it's the sin living right. in me. This is Paul. Yep. I love and it. no it's, one it's would argue and say he's not saved. He's saved. Yes, it's amazing. Yeah, it is like a riddle. Yeah. He yeah. says, for I know that nothing good lives in me. Right. A saved man saying, there's still nothing good in me. I, I still deal with my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but the ability, there is no ability to do it. For I do not do the good I want to do, but practice the evil I don't want to do. Now, does that mean Paul was going around sinning all the time? No. no. Of not. He says that later on. But he's wrestling with the flesh. Right. There's still that temptation. And he goes on in exasperation. Verse 24 says, what a wretched <laughs> man I am. Who can deliver me from this body of death? Now, I, I read all of that so we could read verse 25. Because this is key. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, I myself am serving um, uh, in the law of God, but in my flesh, the law of sin. He says, thank God for Jesus. All right. Because what he's saying is, if I'm, if my flesh is responsible for my salvation, he's saying, I'm a wretched man. I have no hope. Thank God I'm under the law of Christ. Correct. Right? So <clears throat> here's one other piece, and then we're going to really, really dive into this for a second and hopefully help bring this thing to a mm-hmm. conclusion. In my own personal life, as a young Christian, as a teenager, I really wrestled with the doctrine of salvation because every time I sinned, I did what? Yeah. What do we all do when we yeah. sin as a Christian? We feel guilty. We feel right. convicted of the Holy Spirit. And I didn't understand the difference between condemnation and conviction. Mm-hmm. The Holy Spirit convicts to bring about repentance Satan condemns right. to destroy and to steal and to kill, right? And I was the most miserable Christian teenager on the planet because I was constantly repenting. 
Mm. And not just repenting of, God, I'm sorry, but feeling like I was having to be re-saved over and over again. And when I, the more I got studying the scriptures, you know what I found? There's not one occurrence in the entire scriptures of anyone being saved twice. Correct. Even Peter, who did what all of us would say is the, is the most, you know, unpardonable sin that any of us could ever commit, he publicly denounced Christ right. three times the night Jesus needed him the most of his trial. Publicly. Told everyone. I don't yep. even know him. Yet we never read of Peter being saved again. Oh. What we find is about a week later, Peter Jesus restoring Peter on right. a beach. and saying, you love me? Then get up and go feed my lambs. Right? So... Um, Hebrews talks about this in Hebrews 10. Yep. You can jump in here anytime you want. Oh, no, to. you're on a roll. But, <laughs> and the reason I'm letting me go, because he's got to answer this one question. Yeah, you know, he has to there. answer this part. And then once we get to that part, we so when he answers this, then there's an, an obvious next question, and that is, then what is it? Yes. What is unpardonable then? Yeah. If suicide is not it, then what is it? Yeah. So we got to make sure we're clear about salvation. Right. Um. Because you got to pull the emotions out of it. Right. What does scripture say about salvation? Hebrews 10, 11 through 14 says this. I'm just giving you a lot of scripture, I know. But man, this is such a subject. We cannot just briefly say something and not give you the scripture references you need. Hebrews 10 says, Every priest stands day after day ministering and offering the same sacrifices time after time, which can never take away sins. He's talking about the Jewish Mm. priest and the Jewish sacrificial system. He said, But this man, talking of Jesus, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, Forever. sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus is not still on the cross. Right. He's paid the debt. He is now waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. And for by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Now, this is key. He's perfected forever those being sanctified, right? saved, and being saved. In other words, redeemed, yet not perfect, being made perfect through our life and our devotion to Christ. Is it possible for a Christian to sin? Yeah. Of course it is. And if you don't understand the true doctrine of salvation, then what you have to conclude is that we're only saved uh, as long as we we are in between the two sins. Mm. And that means we would have to be re-saved every time we sin. Right. So therefore, yeah, in that case, if that's your view, anybody commits suicide, they can't repent afterwards. Right. And that's how I've heard it preached. So therefore, they went to hell because they couldn't repent. Couldn't repent. That's right. Well, the big question you have to ask is, are we only saved between sins? And is it repentance that saves us? Right, because we would have to have sinless perfection to right. stay saved. Right. Because if not, we're getting re-saved daily. Right. And Scripture just doesn't teach about being saved twice. It never breaches that subject whatsoever because there's really no, in fact, it would say you're crucifying Christ more than once in that case. And and, and, and he does speak against that. Exactly. He's not been crucified every time we sin. No, it's, it's a, once it's a one-time thing. And it happened, you know, at, on in Calvary over 2000 years ago and it covered a multitude of sins and suicide is included amongst those. Exactly. And, and so if suicide is based off everything that we know, because suicide falls within that umbrella of things that cannot remove you from the love of God. Mm-hmm. If you are, or if you are His, say, nothing yeah, can separate. If you are His, then you, they can, nothing can take it away. Right. So if suicide falls under that, and there and there is clearly, according to the Bible, an unpardonable sin. Mm-hmm. What is that unpardonable sin? I think we all know mm-hmm. what it is. And I picked it up here. It says it in a few places. I think, to be honest with you, you can go back a little farther. I think uh, what's happened over the centuries is there was this this chasm between ideologies and and because we wonder the the roots of these issues sometimes uh, I think we want to put, there's this 
fear or this desire. I think in within our circles, there's a fear of putting levels on sin, mm -hmm. right? That there's sure. no sin, sin, no matter what. We hear that a lot. Yeah. That's not necessarily true. Right. And I think that the Protestants, uh, the reformers overcorrecting, trying to separate themselves a little bit <laughs> from, from mortal sins versus uh, venial sins and where there were different levels of sins. And, and, and the reason they try to separate themselves was because the forgiveness of those sins, depending on the magnitude of them, for forgiveness required different amounts, different types of penance. Penance, yeah, mm -hmm. for lack of a better word. Sometimes money, right? Sometimes other actions, right? And so, and to separate from that, which long isn't biblical, which is not biblical. Right. So to separate themselves from that, I think they overcorrected, mm -hmm. and a lot for years now we've heard that all sins are equal. When we know scripturally speaking, Christ tells the pilot that the Jewish leaders have committed a worse sin than him. It's like we see it literally over and over again, over and all. We know within the Mosaic law, some sins are elevated by being referred to as particularly heinous and are therefore what they're an abomination. Domination, right? Mm -hmm. right, uh, right. The Bible also shows us there are varying degrees of punishment in hell, depending on the severity of offense. That's Luke 12, 4, 47 through 48. Jesus often determined the sins of the Pharisees to be more repulsive than the sins of others. Over and over again, mm -hmm. we hear that, hey, yeah, this sin's a little bit worse than another sin. So if that's not correct, what in and and if and the only thing about sin is what an unpardonable heart. So if somebody who has never repented of mm -hmm. any sin, somebody who has not received Christ, every unrepentant sin, the outcome is what is death. That's what right. the Bible says. The outcome of sin is death. Yeah, right. And so of course the only retribution or correction for that is a belief in Christ because He was the perfect sacrifice. Which brings us to Matthew twelve thirty one, and this is the one that gets everybody. And so I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the spirit mm -hmm. will not be forgiven. Right. Anyone who speaks a word against the son of man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or the age to come. And so that's why I've heard people say what Peter did wasn't mm -hmm. that right. because he, he, he said something negative against Jesus or the yeah. son of man, yeah. but he didn't blaspheme the Holy spirit. Right. And so that's where that is. That is the, um, but to be honest that we all know this, the only unpardonable sin is in fact, blaspheming the Holy spirit, but right. no, now what is blaspheming the Holy spirit? What is it? And so we know if you take the, the Greek word blasphemy, that in Greek, it simply means rail against. Yes. To rail against. To rail so, against. and it's interesting that the word that they use here is what? Speaks against the Holy Spirit. Well, that's literally what you're doing when you speak against. You're railing. Right. You are denying. And then, then it comes down to what is the purpose and what is the function of the Holy Spirit. And there's a lot of things. We know that the Holy Spirit has a lot of functioning, what it does for the believer. Mm -hmm. We know it's the, it's, the, it's the friend. We know it's the one that leads us through. It enables us to be able to make our way through. This. And there's Bible verses. I got a thousand of them. Mm -hmm. We're not going to read all of them. I mean, it regenerates. It renews the believer. At the moment of salvation, the Spirit baptizes the believer into the body of Christ. It's Romans 6, 3. Believers receive a new birth by the power of the Spirit, John 3, 5-8. Yep. through 8. The Spirit comforts believers with fellowship and joy as they go through this hostile world. That's 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, 2 right. Corinthians 13, 14. The Spirit in His mighty power fills believers with all joy and peace mm -hmm. and trust the Lord, causing believers to overflow with hope. That's right. Romans 15, 13. We also know the sanctification aspect of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is also the gift giver. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them all. That's, That's right. 1 Corinthians 12, 4. The spiritual gifts that believers possess are given by the Holy Spirit as He determines in His wisdom. That's verse 11. So, but the Holy Spirit also does the work on the unbeliever. Right. And that's the key. It is because all of these workings of the Spirit in the believer right. are null and void. Exactly. If he doesn't do his initial work right. on the heart of the unbeliever. And then you get into what? You get into John 16 and 8. Jesus promised that he would send the Holy Spirit to convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. That's right. And then the Spirit testifies of Christ, John 15, 26, pointing people to the Lord. Mm -hmm. So that is literally when, when if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, it is railing against or it's speaking against what the Holy Spirit came to do to an un, for an unbeliever. And that is point them toward salvation, exactly. point the, the non-believer toward Jesus Christ. And if somebody does not 
put their, give their heart to Christ, does not believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that he did the things that he did, that he does not believe, if one does not believe the gospel, then you have indeed performed the unpardonable sin. Yeah, you have hardened your heart right. against the Spirit of God, and when you harden yourself against the Spirit, and this is, I think this is very important for everyone to understand, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit cannot be committed by a believer. Right. Because you have already been sealed by the Holy Spirit. It is an unbeliever who blatantly right, and with knowledge and willingly, willingly is rejecting the spirit of the living God. Right. You know, when you go to Matthew 12 and you take that whole passage there in context, mm-hmm. what did Jesus just get through preaching? He just got through preaching about his death, burial, and resurrection, referring back to Jonah. Right. It says, as it was in the days of Jonah. Goodness. And he was actually preaching the gospel, though they didn't recognize it. And the religious leaders were so upset over this. They began to uh, to proclaim that all of Jesus' work and all of the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus was the work of Beelzebub. Right. They knew better. They knew the scriptures. Mm-hmm. This was a blatant disregard to the work of the Spirit of God. And so Romans tells us at that point, when you are just blatant and refuse over and over again the work of the Holy Spirit, your conscience becomes seared Seared. like a hot iron. You never have the chance of salvation after that because you've crossed the deadline. You have put yourself up against the Spirit of God. You've shook your fist at the face of the Spirit, in the face of the Spirit. And now you will no longer feel the conviction. And if you do not feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you cannot be saved. Jesus, John 6, 44 says, no one can come to me unless the Spirit draws them. This is why it's so important. If you feel the Holy Spirit of God drawing you, don't keep shaking your fist at the Lord. Receive him. Trust in him. Because that's where the blasphemy comes in. It is refusal denial, blatant, railing against, railing against the spirit of God. And and this is important for you to understand because I mean, I, I, of course, most people know my background, you know, my family, we grew up in a, in a Pentecostal full gospel style background. And, uh, I remember my grandmother telling me about this lady on this very passage, how misunderstood it was Mm -hmm. in, 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 in that time period. And she talked about this woman who just loved the Lord. And she, uh, She'd come to church. She was faithful to church. And, and in the church word, you know, one night someone just really got motivated in the spirit and began to sing and shout mm-hmm. and, 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 you know, just really got into the moment. Yep. And she got <laughs> tickled at that woman's, other woman's reactions. Right. To the spirit. She got tickled. And later on, Satan used that with this verse with her not understanding what it means to rail against the spirit and that this is for unbelievers, not believers and condemned her. And my grandmother believed that woman went to her grave, believing she could not go to heaven anymore because she laughed at someone in the spirit. And therefore she blasphemed the Holy spirit. And that is not what this scripture is saying. No, it is not. We've, I think we've kind of laid out exactly what blaspheming the Holy Spirit is. It's literally denying the work of the Holy Spirit in the in, as an unbeliever, keeping Jesus out of your heart. So forcibly uh, going against Christ, the God's will, which is all men be saved. Mm-hmm. You're literally saying, no, it's not for me. I mean, you might not be doing saying it in words directly, but you have crossed that line. And, that, and that's very important because how many times have well-meaning folks said about someone who passed on who never— would receive Christ, but they say, but I believe they're probably in heaven because they were really good, good person. people. Yeah. Being a really good person is not how we get saved. Again, that goes back to salvation by works. Salvation is for anyone who surrenders their life to Christ, receives what Christ has done. If you reject that, Jesus said he's the only way to the Father. Right. And that is blasphemy, right. railing against the Spirit, rejecting and, and the Spirit. Bear repeating, I'll repeat this verse at the very beginning of it specifically. Matthew 12, 31, and so I tell you, this is Jesus talking, every, every sin, so I include suicide, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, 
but the blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven. And so it tells you right there, there's only one sin that can't be forgiven. And that's the blaspheming of the Holy ghost. And we already talked about what that is. So as as original, as we originated this question, it was, is suicide unforgivable, unpardonable? Well, evidently not because it included, it's a sin, like every sin, but it's I think pardonable. It's, I think it's great. And I think this might be helpful for some people too, because you know, you, you do, you, you go to that funeral or you go talk to those families or someone talks about, all right, well, what, what about this believer? If you're saying that, you know, they still went to heaven, but look at all the pain they cause and all right. that. Listen, scripture actually deals with this. Right. And it talks about a believer not losing their salvation, but losing their rewards in heaven. See, just as you mentioned a moment ago, Scripture is clear. There are levels, variances of sin. There's also variances of reward. rewards. There is in heaven. I mean, it's everybody we in our we Western concept that. to to make it easy on everybody. Everybody just wants to say, "Oh, well, we're yeah. all going to get to heaven. We all get the same size house, right?" right. <laughs> no, it's not true. Yeah, I don't think mansions is what we think it is in the hymn, right? In Scripture, um, but dwelling places in the. I mean, it's, Paul talks about levels of heaven. Yeah, so, and that's the subject for We won't day, go there. <laughs> we're going to be there together with the Lord, but we need to understand there are rewards, and here's what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 right. through 15 is talking to believers, and it says, For no one can lay any foundation other than that which is laid down. The foundation is Jesus Christ. That's it. It's the only way of salvation. And if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, this is our works right. on the foundation. We're not saved by our, our works. We're saved by Jesus. But then the life we live is what we build upon our salvation. It can be gold, silver, and costly stones. He also says, or wood, hay, straw. Yep. Each one's work will become obvious. When? Yeah, and, Hebrews yeah, says, it's point unto man wants to die, yep. then the... Judgment. We're all going to stand before the Lord. Not if you're saved, not to see if you're going to go to heaven or hell, but for this purpose right here. For the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. Right. What is symbolic of fire in the scriptures? God's judgment, God's eyes, God sees the motive. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. Mm. If it was done for the Lord and done with the right motive, there's a reward coming. If anyone's work is burned up, he'll experience loss. Now, catch this. Here's the line. But he himself will be saved as only by fire. Still going into heaven. Right. But we will have the acknowledgement that we could have and should have. Right. And you say, well, how's that heaven? Well, just wait till you get there and you'll find out. All right. <laughs> that is a long, deep. It is, isn't it? Long, but, deep one. Yeah. But that's. Woo. But think about it. Oh, gnashing of teeth. So, with a suicide, if the person. So, you have to go back to the suicide then right. and ask the question before they committed suicide, were they truly saved or not? Right. Then there's a whole aspect of mental health. 100%. And emotional and, 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 and mental emotional health. health. Agreed. Because I, I personally believe I, most people commit suicide. There is some mental or emotional health decline in that moment to drive them to that moment, right? right? There are consequences to that. Pain, loss, people questioning their testimony after that. There's an asterisk beside their testimony. The whole leaving their family and your loved ones with the what could I have done different. Exactly. That one's the worst. That's a lot of pain. It is. Listen, that's a lack of a reward right there. What it does to the people left behind. Is it the unpardonable sin? I don't think that's no. what Scripture teaches, but there is pain involved, and everyone needs to understand that. Right? Where they say before the event. Yep, exactly. So to wrap that up, it's not a it's not a salvation issue. It's a, it's a where you were standing issue at the moment of that sin, mm-hmm. and that sin in this case is suicide, in which mm-hmm. of course there is no correcting that with the people you love. And so you'll right. stand, you'll stand, you'll stand before God for and get, it and answer and for you'll it. answer for it. And, uh, and it won't be a glorious day for you. I mean, you'll be in glory, you'll, you'll know. but, but you'll know, you'll know. I think your there's failures. a reason revelation says he wipes away every tear from yeah, our eyes. Right. Cause they're not all tears of joy. Oh, I, I agree. So, so I mean, we're going, no one will be in heaven going, I, I deserve to be here. Ouch. We're going to be praising him for eternity because we're going to know the only reason why we're there is his grace. 
man, we're, we're gonna do deep, we're gonna do the heaven and hell thing one of these days. It's on the agenda. I just we're not going there now because that is a crazy picture, and it is again, it's not black and white like we've all come to believe. It is layered, and it is layered, and it is interesting, and not for now. Question two, and probably our last one is because these are big, these are deep. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Question great. two: Does First Peter three twenty one teach that baptism is necessary? for salvation and i will read 18 through 22 just so we have a good basis for christ also suffered once for sins the righteous for the unrighteous that he might bring us to god being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit in which he went he is jesus of course and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight, persons were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is now at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. And that is a interesting verse. <laughs> it has all kinds of context in there. We're not going to get into all of it. I promise you that. If we, if you fully unraveled this whole thing, you would be getting into uh, some of the apocrypha that is mentioned briefly in here. Uh, which is also kind of, you'll see it again in Jude. Again, we're not getting to that, but it can get really, really, really deep. And that's why it sounds weird, I guess, for lack of a better word, when you read it. It's like it's kind of confusing, confusion, a lot of com- confusing aspects to it. I think it's based off of our our, our lack of knowledge and some mm-hmm. of the references going on here. But as the question specifically asked, and I know I've heard this many times, and I know – Without naming names, there are particular denominations that believe that salvation and necessity uh, of, of, of uh, baptism is a necessity of salvation. And they'll bring this verse up. I've had it sure. brought up to me a few times. Sure, me too. And, uh, and so, again, we'll read that part. Um, baptism, which corresponds to this, which is what? Well, back in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt the, of the body, but as an appeal to God for good conscience. So, mm-hmm. so what is this whole but baptism saves you about here? You know, th- this is so funny. When you read Peter's writings, right. Peter actually makes a reference to the Apostle Paul. Correct. Because people were struggling reading Paul's letters. And he says, Paul says some things that are really hard to understand. Yeah. Okay. And here Peter's doing go, the exact Peter. same thing, right? A, a deep moment by Peter confuses yeah. a lot Peter, of people. 2,000 years, people have been arguing over this passage. Right. All right, let's get back to Scripture. Right. Because, you again, you can't take one verse out of context. you got to see the totality, again, now, of when... At, at, what ele- at what stage are we regenerated? Right. Is it regeneration once we get into the water? Or is the water a symbol of the regeneration we've received through faith in Christ and confession of sin? Which is interesting because the entirety of this of this of this letter or book, however you want to talk about it, is the message that Peter is trying to communicate throughout the whole the totality of it is is that that Christians must live in this earth uh, to and withstand persecution and per- persevere th- through their faith, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That is literally what he's trying to communicate. He had this little aside here, and this is the thing it seem- seemingly that everybody remembers. Mm-hmm. And as you said, we just need to know now then, since he put it out there, and since evidently his audience understood it, but we may be unclear. Yeah, I, th- I think for some, we pick out this one verse. Right. And, and we're not something. even reading the totality of what Peter said in the other passages. Right. Or what is in front of it or behind it, because it actually clears it up. It does. And then <laughs> if you go back to when did – look at Peter's faith experience right. and his first sermon in Acts chapter 2. Mm, that's good. Yeah. So here's a man who denied the Lord. We talked about this a moment ago, three times the night of Jesus needing the most. Right. And then uh, he then is restored. Mm. On the day of Pentecost – just a few weeks later, right? He preaches, and this is always 
in the world I grew up in always brought a lot of confusion. It's like, so Acts 2.38. Right. Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. First unto you and to your children and your children's children. Did Peter have the authority, first of all, to give a different baptism than what Jesus gave in Matthew 28 when he says, go make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? Of course not. Is that two different baptisms? Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. Peter didn't have the right to supersede Jesus's last words before he ascended to heaven. All right. What Peter was doing was remember who his audience was. And this is where we read the Bible from our context mm-hmm. instead of the original context. Peter is speaking to Jews right. from multiple countries who are in the city for Pentecost. And he, and, and listen, Jewish people understood baptism. See, a lot of times in Christian church, I think we think baptism is something we came up with. No, no. Jews were already baptizing. Other religions baptized. It was a it was a picture. It was always a picture of dying to something and being born into something else. Uh, a, a Gentile could convert to Judaism, right? And he would be baptized. And Peter, what he's doing here is, can you imagine what Peter felt like when he denied the Lord? I think this is why this is such a soapbox for Peter. When he denied the Lord, he was ashamed. Correct. He would never be ashamed again after Jesus restored him. On the day of Pentecost, he says, every one of you, you got to be baptized. And let me be clear. What is the only name to the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit? It's not a different baptism, y'all. He was just given the name. Right. He was saying, you need to be baptized to Jesus. Correct. He was actually fulfilling Matthew 28. Uh, 19 and 20, he was in agreement with it. Right. And because salvation's only in Jesus. And yeah, so and that idea, the theology of the name has also been around in the Old Testament. They talked about it quite a bit. The Jews have been yeah. talking about that for millennia. They always talked, they talked about the, the authority of that name or the name. They, they mentioned the name. So that what we call the, the name theology has been out there for, for, for millennia up to even to this point. Mm-hmm. So for his audience, as you just mentioned, having a, 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 a Jewish background exclusively, they 100% understood when he mentioned that because that, there was yeah. no separation between the name, the Father, and, and, and the Holy and he, Spirit. And, and none he of knew that. you can't be a secret Christian. Right. You're exactly right. That's why he's so hard on baptism. It's because, yeah, you can put your faith in Christ. Jesus is the only way. He preached that in Acts chapter 4, right? Right. Verse 12. There's salvation in no one else other than Jesus Christ. He's telling you, you got to be baptized because. He is preaching against what he himself committed when he denied the Lord out of fear of being known. Right. And now, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he's saying, you guys can't be secret Christians. Right. If you there's cannot. one thing old Peter's learned, is you got to come out in the open and not be ashamed of, and, of your Savior. And, and baptism is what? It had it to be was, a public thing. And it was always a public declaration right. that you have chosen to convert to that faith. Right. And so now go back to his letter, right? And you read this right. before and after the passage that causes so much confusion. He says, verse 18, Christ suffered for sins once and for all, righteous for the unrighteous. He's going back to the gospel. Right. Jesus Christ is the way of salvation. He brings us to God through his death in the flesh. He made us alive in the spirit. Whoa, wait a minute. Regeneration how? Right. By the spirit. spirit. This corresponds right. with the rest of the New Testament. Right. Right. Romans 10, 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Ephesians 1, 13, you are sealed with the promise Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth and you believed, right? Right. Peter's agreeing with that. And then when he, then he goes into Noah and his Jewish audience knew the story of Noah. Right. And he says, look at Noah. He got in an ark and went through. The waters. And Correct. then he says the key line here that we can't miss. And now baptism corresponds. Yep. And something that uh, Western thinkers don't think. <laughs> <laughs> right. We don't consider very well is the Jewish way of learning is through visual right. images. It's types. It's types and yep. shadows. And so... For the Jew, they understood, watch this, water is symbolic of judgment. Right. The ark is the vessel Mm 
in which God used to bring Noah and his family through the judgment. Correct. Noah had to put his faith in the vessel God chose right. to get through the water. Nowhere here is Peter saying the water was salvation. Correct. The ark was the safety net to get through the waters of judgment. And what what is Jesus to us putting our faith in Christ? Yep. Is we are redeemed and forgiven. Baptism then is a public declaration that we are safe over judgment because of the ark of safety. Right. Jesus, Jesus our is the Savior. Ark. Yep. He's the ark, right? right? And he goes on and closes it that way yep. when he says... This, and he makes sure everybody understands. He says, I'm not talking about the removal of dirt from right. the body. Which is the outward. That's the physical water. Right. He wasn't talking about physical water. This is not outward. So this is not what baptism's intent was. It's not no. an outward thing. It's not an outward testimony. It's not an no. outward I'm a, a loyalty to, the, to, well, the to God. The water is not the method of salvation. Exactly. He says it's the pledge of a good conscience right. toward God through the resurrection of Christ. Right. So baptism then becomes an image for us to say we're not ashamed that our redemption is in Christ alone. So does baptism supersede confession of faith? No. No. Confession of faith to salvation, baptism should be then the next step for us to declare it publicly. Now, I know some of you will disagree with that, but this is the totality of Scripture. And then you go to the thief on the cross. Right. He wasn't saved by water, but he was saved when he put his faith in Christ upon that cross that day. Correct. So we have to look at not one verse, but the totality of Scripture, because then when one verse doesn't make sense, then we have to go back and restudy that one verse and make sure we understand all the perspective there, the context, and the backstory. And hopefully we help clear that up a little bit today. Yeah, no, you, you laid it out really well whenever you talked about the process, because it is a process, because the baptism aspect, that is literally publicly letting the world know that you are now deployed and employed by, by the kingdom of heaven. Mm-hmm. It is literally you're, you're pointing your face at the enemy publicly and saying what Christ did on the cross, what Christ did through his life, the gospel, through the, through the cross, his resurrection. We are, you, you are, we are, are putting you on, on, on notice that mm-hmm. this is a war and this is a spiritual war. And we're just making a declaration right now mm-hmm. that we are standing for the father. And this is why here in our church, we baptize people who've made a confession right. of faith. This is, and I know this is part of what brought about the Protestant reformation, you know, and the difference between believers baptism and the practices of say the Roman Catholic church or some church of Christ movements that believe in regeneral a baptismal regeneration, right? Right. We we believe that salvation is through faith in Christ alone, and so we declare it through baptism. We believe that's what the passage is teaching here. Yeah, I agree. You know. So, so we're going to probably stop at those two questions since they were fairly deep and long winded on our part. All but. hate mail is sent to Darren Deloach. <laughs> D Deloach so. at your CPC <laughs> Church. Zach will drop the my uh, email there. So if you have any questions about what we talked about. We understand, but we just want you to know we'll be back. We got some some more. We actually have more, a few more questions to answer. We'll get to so them. we'll do we'll get to as many as we can, and we've got a couple, three more of these episodes coming. We're just going to take, and we're going to not shortchange you. We we honor and uh, your questions, and we're not just going to give you some frivolous little little eh, and then go on. We're going to actually dive into it and try to answer you thoroughly and using scripture and using scripture to to interpret scripture and, yeah. and, and through just, and sometimes through our experiences and different things, but we're going to answer every one of them as thoroughly as we can. And our hope is that yeah. we get a chance to see you again, that from this point forward, you live a life complete, that you live a life on point, And we will see you all really, really soon.